Uh, welcome to our second roundtable in the Modern Languages and Literature's uh, Diversity Vocabulary Initiative. Um, the theme of this roundtable is Exploding the Gender Binary. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce our four uh, panelists today. Um, and then uh, each of them will give about a five minute uh, kind of position um, statement. And then we will open it up to two questions uh, among the panelists and then obviously among all of the students and, and faculty who have come here today. Thank you for being here. Um, we know it's a, it's, it's a challenging day to be here. And so we thank you all for being here. Um, our first speaker is Kiki Kosnick. Uh, a former first-generation college student and a queer human, Kiki Kosnick holds a PhD from the University of Wisconsin, Key State right now. They are currently an assistant professor of French and women, gender, and sexuality studies at Augustana College in Rock Island, Illinois, where they teach courses on French language, Francophone liter literary and cultural studies, and queer theory. Kiki won the 2019's Florence Howe Award for Outstanding Feminist Scholarship from the Women's Caucus of the Modern Languages Association for their article, The Everyday Poetics of Gender Inclusive French Strategies for Navigating the Linguistic Landscape. Our second speaker will be Vergeno. Vergeno is a socio sociolinguist, a digital ethnographer, and a literary translator from Hungarian to Italian. She teaches as a contract professor at the University of Florence and has an ongoing collaboration with Zanichelli Publishing House. She also hosts a daily radio show on Italian language with journalist Carlo Cianetti on the Radio One Rai. Her main interests are digital communications, gender issues in language and linguistic divulgation with the goal of a democratic linguistic education as stated by linguist Tullio De Mauro in the late 60s. The eight books she has published so far explore the relationship between Italian language and its speakers from different points of view. Our third speaker will be Joy Layden. Joy Layden holds the Gottsman Chair in English at Yeshiva University, and in 2007 became the first and still only openly transgender employee of an Orthodox Jewish institution. A poet, memoirist, and essayist, she has worked, uh, she has long work at the intersection of gender identity, religious tradition, and literature. Her memoir, Through the Door of Life, A Jewish Journey Between Genders, was a finalist for National Jewish Book Award and prompted conversations about trans and Jewish identities around the country. Her most recent book, The Soul of the Stranger, Reading God and Tor from Transgender Perspective, a Lambda Literary Award and Triangle Award finalist, the first book length work of a trans theology from a Jewish perspective. Recognized as a founding exponent of trans poetics, she has published nine books of poetry including two Lambda Literary Award finalists, and most recently, The Future is Trying to Tell Us Something, New and Selected Poems. Her work has been uh, recognized yeah, with I, the National Down. One of our colleagues uh, got locked out of her office. Hold on one second, let me mute Mikael. Uh, her work has been recognized with the National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, a Fulbright Scholarship, and an American Council of Learning, Study, uh, uh, Learning Society's Research Fellowship, among many other honors. Our final speaker will be Juan Neminetto. Uh, um, Juan is a, uh, is a senior lecturer in the Latin American and Iberian Cultures Department at Columbia University. His research focuses on queer theory, queer pedagogy, Brazilian culture, and visual media. His latest publications, Queer Pedagogy, Approaches to Inclusive Teaching, deals with LGBTQA, inclusion in the foreign language uh, classroom, he has also published articles on foreign language textbooks, the representation of effeminacy in Brazilian telenovelas, and activist and writer, literary and literary critic Herbert Daniel. He is currently writing a book titled Anthropophagic Queer, Brazilian Contemporary Cinema, which is forthcoming from Wayne State University. Uh, uh, Juan is also a poet who writes and performs as Juan Maria Cicero. Um, so thank you and a great welcome to all of our panelists here. Thank you to all the students and, and everyone who has showed up today. Uh, my name is Andrew Clark. I'm chair of the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures here. And I also wanted to just thank all the fantastic colleagues I have in Modern Languages 
who have been working on this uh, Modern Languages Diversity Initiative project uh, throughout the summer and this fall. So we will start with Kiki. Thanks so much. Um, what an inspiring project first, and um, thanks for inviting me. Um, I was really pleased to learn this was going to be a conversation across languages as well, because I think when we are able to recognize that each language has its own set of issues, they're not all the same. It can remind us that these are indeed linguistic problems, right? That the problems are not with us, they're not with our identities, they're not with our genders. The problems are with the possibilities of the languages that we're working within and sometimes around and against. And so in the context of French, um, I really wanna try to keep it brief. <laughs> um, there has been so much debate recently about gender inclusivity in French, and it mostly focuses on inclusivity of the feminine, right? Like that has been the hot topic. The French Academy has been very... Um, Kiki, I think we, we lost People you there. are familiar with seeing. I, I think we're, I don't know if I'm the only one, but I think we're, we're, we're losing you. Yeah, I'm also losing you. Yeah. She's trying we'll to recognize it right we'll now. Yeah, we'll try to. Maybe, maybe we should. Um... Why don't we wait another uh, few seconds? But if, if she can't if she can't get back in right now, maybe we can uh, move forward with uh, Vergeno, um, and then we can come back to Kiki uh, a little bit later. Um, as you as you wish. Okay. Yeah, I, I think we should do that in the interest of time because uh, okay. we have limited time. So let me just spotlight you, and then. Um, okay. Right. Thank you very much, Vera. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, um, first of all, uh, bear with my English. I'm not used to uh, present my work in English, so this is kind of new for me. Um, as a sociolinguist, um, I have been mainly concerned with the relationship with it, between uh, people and the language they use. Um, and for some reasons, I have uh, always um, try to understand what happens when the linguistic habits do not uh, adhere to what is considered a norm. So this includes substandard uh, uses, uh, jargons, uh, uh, language deployed across social media, uh, which uh, I have been particularly found, uh, fond about. And in a way, in these contexts, uh, language customs are even more of an act of identity than usual. So every time you go away from the norm, you step away from the norm, from what is normal in a language, you find something very interesting about um, the, the identity of the people who uses this kind of, uh, of, uh, of languages. So mixing these interests for the last 25 years, roughly, I have found myself um, in the middle of huge linguistic discussions, especially on social media platforms. So I'm, an, I'm a dinosaur of social media, I could say so, because I entered social media in 1995. So I have seen a lot of things going on. And um, I have seen in Italy uh, a huge interest for linguistic issues. And uh, it's very funny to study how do non-linguists, non so non people who have not um, uh, a special linguistic uh, preparation um, react in front when they are um, in front of a, a strange uh, linguistic use. So uh, many of the things I have, of the essays I have written deal with this. So how do people react to, uh, well, essentially to everything that is new in language. 
And um, it is very interesting for me to note that Italians, probably also people from other countries, uh, react uh, with a lot of aggressiveness when um, the Italian as we know it is challenged. So a new linguistic custom comes in and most people react with a lot of, um, you know, like fear for, for the change. And in the last few years, one of my main research topics has become the usage of feminine uh, profession names, uh, as Kiki was starting to, to tell about French. Because as you know, Italian is a gendered language, so every noun is either masculine or feminine. So we have the normal uh, masculine forms as, as ministro, minister, rettrice, uh, rettore, sorry, the director of a university, uh, deputato, deputy in the parliament. And in recent years, of course, uh, women have um, reached these um, positions, these job positions. And so very slowly, it has become to become more common to uh, hear forms like ministra, which is the feminine form, rettrice of rettore, deputata of deputato. And this usage, which, which uh, could seem very normal, as we have to deal with the females, so why not call them with a feminine uh, noun, has encountered an incredible amount of opposition from both men and women. So it's not only men that are against this kind of usage, but it's also women who say that um, the, the masculine form sounds better, um, sounds uh, more serious, you know, so they don't want to change their title to a feminine one. And this was the first part of my, of my work. Uh, while conducting field research on this matter, I came in contact with representatives of uh, LGBTQA plus communities, and um, they made me reflect on something else, uh, which is the misrepresentation uh, made by our language, by Italian language, of non-binary persons, because we don't have a, a neutral form, of course. And um, so what did they came up with? Um, I, I made a sort of, a, of, a, of list of all the ways that LGBTQA plus groups try to go over this so-called so limit of Italian language, which includes the use of um, the asterisk of the U instead of the O at the end of the word, uh, of the words, uh, like tutti instead of tutti, which means uh, everybody. Hmm? Uh, the X uh, and so on. But many people complained that uh, the asterisk, which is the most used uh, to signal a sort of uh, neutral form, has not a pronunciation. So half jokingly, I came up with a, a suggestion to use the schwa. You probably know the schwa, it's a sign of the International Phonetic Alphabet and um, it represents the, the middle vowel. And by the way, it's never stressed. You know, there is a meme that says, I want to be a schwa, I don't want to be stressed. Schwa is never stressed. Uh, and um, this, this uh, very playful suggestion I made um, provoked a sort of, uh, of earthquake, I would say, in the um, public opinion. Um, nobody, of course, listened to my suggestion, to what was exactly my suggestion, and, uh, and they just came down on me very violently. So currently I have become this sort of a partisan of the schwa, which was not the role I was looking for. But uh, well, I have to say that I am living a very interesting moment of my life. And, um, and I hope to study on this matter much more. That's why I'm very happy to be here today. And I'm sorry for my English again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and um... I don't think we're still trying to get Kiki back on, but I don't think she's back on yet. I don't see her yet. Um, so why don't we go forward with uh, with Joy Layden? Thank you again, Vera. You're welcome. Uh, thank you. Um, I am. I want to talk about my work in relation to gender, not from uh, the level of. Uh, uh, linguistic systems or social systems or institutions at those levels you see gender looks like a binary that needs exploding right 
a form where there it says check if you're male or female, for example. Um, based on, I want to come at this from the ground level as somebody who grew up uh, and didn't fit into the gender forms of the uh, society around me. I had a sense of self and I could not locate it or express it adequately in the, um, in the social systems, social framework of the US culture of the 1960s, 70s and 80s. Um, and when I was growing up, I thought that this was an idiosyncratic problem that I was, one, everybody else could just fit into these um, forms. Everybody else was male or female and uh, knew the way that gender worked for them absolutely expressed them. The way they looked on the outside totally corresponded to the way they were on the inside. However, the longer I've lived, the more I have come to realize that that's actually not true for anybody. That the problem which is often acute for uh, gender queer people, uh, trans people, non-binary people, exists in one way or another for all human beings, because no matter how gender is configured, whether it's configured as a male-female binary or as um, a system that includes more gender options, no uh, human individuality actually fits into static categories like that. Those categories are tools that we use to simplify the messiness of human individuality to create relationships and communities and institutions, but they don't completely work or exhaustively describe anybody. So that there is an essential queerness in relation to any a gender system that you can find at the level of individual human beings. When you realize that, then when I realized that, I realized that my goal wasn't to figure out how to take a certain essence within me and fit it into a gender system that was outside me. It was to recognize how I was going to participate in a set of problems and negotiations that everybody deals with all the time. So I've come to think of not the gender binary as one static universal thing, but gender as a highly localized um, set of systems that are often overlapping and simultaneous. So I teach at an Orthodox Jewish university. There is officially a very conservative, uh, theologically inflected version of binary gender, but I carry a different version of gender with me. Our systems of gender coincide and they don't explode. And in fact, I think that's a normal thing that different people bring and different uh, ha have multiple systems of gender that we move among and negotiate. So I've come to think of identity and gender as a three-part system. Part of it's self-identification, who we know ourselves to be, which is always only going to partly correspond to the categories our cultures offer. Part of it has to do with how others see us, what others from the outside, how they identify us. Uh, and the third part is what are the roles and obligations and language that our cultures offer us to express our sense of who we are in relation to other people. And for most of us, that some in, works in some ways and doesn't work in other ways. And the mix of what works and doesn't work is continuously shifting as we ourselves change over the course of our lifetimes. So thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Layden. Um, uh, very, very interesting, and um, and I think brings up a lot of a uh, lot of things that we will I assume will lead to uh, questions afterwards. Um, I, I was able uh, Kiki is able to come back. I think she's back. Um, so uh, Kiki, if you're ready to go, um, I will try to spotlight you. Thank you. I'm glad this is recorded so I can go back and hear what you all said. I actually have a theory that like the French Academy probably really hates me. I'm a non-native speaker. I'm just like this first gen queer person who's all like, hey, look at these problems, right? So abridged version that I, <laughs> um, it became very apparent to me when I started teaching French um, as a queer person, having non-binary friends. 
I identified as genderqueer at the time, but I didn't identify as non-binary. I was still using feminine pronouns. Um, that it wasn't okay. I was like, what's going on? What are we going to do? You know, like I can't teach this language if I can't feel that I can include my students, my own life experiences. So at first I got very interested in poetic strategies actually. Well, what parts of the language already work? And so in my teaching, I leverage those, right? Epicenes, you know, verbal structures that are kind of democratic. The first person, second person, it works, right? We get into more problems with third person we get into problems with adjectives, right? And when we start talking about that in French, we have multiple solutions. That mid dot form being one of them, which is quite successful for agreements um, if there's not a difference in pronunciation, right? But if you're trying to have conversations and it's a more complicated adjectival ending, then you get into problems. So, you know, there are proposed systems, um, notably a, a linguist working at the Sorbonne right now who did a whole book on um, inclusive French grammar. Um, and I personally am a fan of multiple approaches, multiple strategies, right? But negotiating how to find a space in your own linguistic communities that works for the, the people who are speaking and who are using the language, right? So that my students can identify forms that feel like a good fit for them, even if when they're going out into the world, other people might not know what those forms are. So they need to be prepared to be flexible, right? So in my approaches, I try to prioritize <laughs> both um, the most intelligible, most practical forms, but never at the expense of inclusion of someone, right? But we, we have to work on those strategies together. And so I guess my main position is the need for feminist and queer in the non-binary sense coalition building. I don't believe we should have one form that works for everybody. I think folks need their own individual visibility, especially people who have been marginalized linguistically for a long time, which in the French context would be women. <laughs> um, but then also, right, and this is this, this tension between you know, feminist movement around these issues and the need for non-binary inclusion is that often when some advances are made that work for feminine subjects, such as the French Academy last year, finally saying, you're right, we should have feminine forms of professions and roles be acknowledged. Women have been doing these jobs since World War II, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is their statement, that's wonderful, but it creates an additional complication for non-binary folks, right? Because if we were to take the masculine as a neutral, as many people try to argue it is, then everybody can sit comfortably under that umbrella without being really seen in their individuality, whether that's marked by gender or not marked by gender, right? So, so I use a lot of combinatorial approaches and I'm happy to talk about um, kind of how I set that up and, and, and what I do and uh, people have specific questions about it. So yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, Professor Kosnick. Um... And I think that's uh, unfortunately you didn't you didn't get to hear uh, hear Vera, but um, she was talking uh, precisely about some of these things in the Italian context, but also how many of the individuals did not want to use the feminine uh, version because it implied a certain weakness or didn't have the same prestige as the the masculine. Um, so some I think interesting things that will um, need more discussion. Thank you so much. Um, all right, our final uh, final speaker um, will be uh, Juan Nemineto. Um, so let me uh, find you on the spotlight, Juan. Uh, and... All right. So uh, thank you and uh, thank you for uh, the uh, presentations. I'm gonna try to make some contribution now because I think you three just did an excellent, like just spoke a lot of things that we're it's been here with me, and so thank you. So I I come from a Portuguese, uh, actually Brazil, but Portuguese, uh, our first language uh, background, and I teach uh, Portuguese, and I've taught Spanish before, uh, and so it's just like two quick uh, stories about it. So when I was first teaching uh, 10 years ago, that's when I started thinking about queer uh, pedagogy and, and teaching. I was uh, teaching a class and I was being observed by one of the coordinators and uh, one of my students, a cis man, and I've been teaching for uh, four or five weeks. So I knew all these students and one of the students, a cis man said in class in, uh, in Spanish using the masculine, my husband is a doctor. 
And I just kept the class. And after uh, the coordinator just came to me and said that I should have corrected the student because he said my husband and he is a man. And I actually didn't know how to respond to the coordinator in that sense because I knew he was a, a, a gay man and he had a husband for as a fact. And I didn't see the need to correction. And the coordinator said, even, even if he is even if he is gay, you have to correct the students in class to avoid confusions with gender. And yeah, and that is a, and the second story was teaching Portuguese. And one of my students came to me uh, after doing her homework and she could not at home. She was, uh, she had a word, a word that she didn't understand. It was nurse, uh, nurse in Portuguese in the feminine. And she was trying to find the, the meaning of the word and she couldn't. And I just said automatically, oh, you have to look for the masculine because you're not gonna find in the feminine the dictionary. And then she said, what? How come? I, so that little question that I was not questioning at my own position as a cis man, that yes, the dictionary is all in the masculine because the masculine as, as in French, as in Italian, Spanish, Romance languages, is the neutral. Like we use that term, which is a very problematic term to use as the masculine neutral, that we do not find words in, fem, in feminine in the dictionaries, even today. So all those things were like, how do we work with those questions in the classroom? How do we make sure that we are trying to understand different identities, all types of identities in the classroom when we're talking about language? And as, uh, as uh, Vera said, the question of Italian is also Portuguese, we're gendered. There's no option in terms of, uh, there's no neutral words in Portuguese. So what I've been trying to use, and I, 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 I would like for people to understand is like, the concept that I, I'm trying to use is the, the concept of grammatical gender and social gender, which I think it works in my class in the sense that grammatical gender is the question that in Portuguese, uh, a, a mug uh, is feminine. It's a grammatical gender, but social gender is gender that talks about us. And that I don't think we should correct. I don't think we should point out. I, I mean, not point out, but I, I don't think we should mm, correct a student in terms of what gender they're using in class, because we're working in different ways in Portuguese as uh, the examples you guys gave it in French and in Italian and Portuguese too. So in Portuguese, we're using the X as a gender neutral. But then the question of inclusion always bring, bring questions of exclusion because then the visually impaired community said, the X is a problem for us because our machines do not read words with X. So we had to find a different way to be inclusive for non-binary uh, folks in terms of also not excluding visually impaired people who were trying to read the uh, programs. So right now in Portuguese and uh, in Spanish, the idea is we use the E, the letter E, to avoid A, feminine, O, masculine. And like in my classes, I have to accept that as a, as a social gender, as a use, because if I have a, a pop, parts of the population of Portuguese using in their daily lives, it's not my job as a, a, a instructor to say, no, that is not correct. Because I have many examples in daily life of use of non-binary of non inclusive language in, in, in Portuguese. And I have to bring that into class so the students can actually communicate. And we have to find ways. And it's not, as I say, like everybody who says, like uh, the French Academy is saying, like, we should not do it. The, the position when you take as a, what I call like the guardians of language is very serious because you're not language. We're not talking about, we're talking about gender here because nobody cares in Portuguese that we don't use the subjunctive anymore. But then we do care because we don't use the gender. So it's not just grammar. It is social and we have to have those questions and bring those questions as relevant for our uh, daily practices as language instructors and communicators if we're using languages, especially in, in, in those aspects. So I just want to, yes, thank you. And we can talk more in the questions. Thank you so much, Professor Neto. Um, are there any questions for any of the panelists between any of you first before we open it up to questions from the from the students and the public? Can I, can I add a thing uh, also to address what Joao said about the role of the academies? 
Do you mind? Of course. Yeah. Uh, because the, the most um, interesting uh, thing about what happened to me with this schwa thing uh, is the reaction of the, of the, well, of the parallel of the Real Academia Española and of the Académie Française in Italy, which is the Academia della Crusca, uh, which I have been working for for 20 years be before leaving last year. And um, when this issue came up and I was wrongly addressed as an academician of the Crusca, uh, their one and only uh, concern was to distance themselves from me uh, and underlining that I was not an academician or actually they don't, didn't even appell me directly. They said uh, that person is not part of the academia. Uh, and uh, the, 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 what they said about the issue is that the issue does not exist. So they basically uh, said in front of, of the, the whole Italian population that there is no uh, non-binary issue. So, so there, are, there are no non-binary people. They do not exist for them. And this was the most shocking part for me. The, the, the fact that they did, didn't even acknowledge that there is a part of our society that finally has a voice, which is my point of view, and, uh, and, uh, and, and is here and maybe has some uh, language issues with their self-expression and considering this issue non-existent is such a violence for me. So this is why I'm a little angry <laughs> about the situation. Thank you. Um, are there any other any other questions or comments between the panelists, or shall we are we ready to open up to questions to the students? Okay, why don't we, um, if students have any questions or anyone in the public has any questions, just please raise your blue hand. Um, my colleagues, Alessia, Patricia, and Joshua um, will help me try to, to locate them. You can also ask questions in the, in the, in the chat as well. Um, so just let us know if you have any questions. So there, it appears there's one comment uh, in, the, in the chat, which says the problem with Italian language is that we, are, uh, we still are dealing with gender equality in our language, uh, let alone the non-binary non options. Absolutely, yeah. But um, at this point, I, I'm, I'm tuned in with the other um, speakers that, uh, with Kiki especially, uh, I think we should uh, address these issues parallelly, mm? uh, together, <laughs> uh, across genders, because uh, I think that in this moment of space and time, um, we must stick together, mm, feminists and uh, uh, everything else. So I am a, an interse intersectional feminist. I think it's uh, it's the current uh, it's the correct definition in in English. We. Um, and Western is a question, I think. Hi, um, I was just wondering if any of you are familiar with like how gender and gender binary is talked about in like non-gendered languages um, or like languages that aren't like, you know, um, I don't know how exactly to describe it, but that don't have like tenses in terms of gender. I know, I know my colleague uh, Britta Ingbritsen is here who, uh, who teaches Mandarin. And I don't know if, if Britta, you have anything that you want to say about that with respect to Mandarin. Hi, um, hello everyone. Yes, I am a sociolinguist who teaches Mandarin. Um, thanks Anne for that great question. I think a non-gendered, non-grammatically gendered languages if we take this uh, social gender versus grammatical gender split. Um, it's it well first of all sometimes you have two things going on one is um it's perhaps easier to disarticulate sort of thinking about social gender when it's not also grammatically encoded into the language so i think Anne, um as a student of mandarin is thinking about a language like mandarin where uh, traditionally there was no gendered pronoun first uh third person pronoun nor is there gender marking anywhere else in the language um one interesting thing you do find in Chinese is the rise of 
gender and a gendered marking in the written form with the adoption of um, uh, the, the female radical instead of the human radical to mark female third person. So you do have gender coming in in some ways, but of course, um, even a lack of uh, grammatical gender, of course, doesn't necessarily reflect or answer the, the sort of the question of social gender, which is a huge one in China right now, thinking about uh, uh, both uh, feminism and female equality, but also thinking about um, sexuality, LGBTQ issues, how to sort of thinking about non-binary issues is very, um, is actually sort of really at the forefront in Chinese society today. Um, I believe Angela has a question. Angela Zagarella. Yes. Um, yes. So I was muted. Um, thank you very much for this discussion. It's really, really important. I talk about this all the time with my students. I wanted to ask um, Vera, the professor, again, you know, about the option of using the third, um, the third, the, the loro, like it is in English. In English, we use they, the mm -hmm. loro. I don't know if that is used in Italian. I'm actually starting to hear about all these these options in Italian. I've used the recommendation of the Alma, Alma Sabatini, which I think they're great, but they go up to a certain point. Like yes. they go with the gender equality, as I wrote in my comment, in terms of reflecting the, the society the way it is now with the mm -hmm. non-binary option. I don't, I don't have any, so I don't know. So I'm glad, grateful for your suggestion that you put on the chat mm -hmm. about the, the, the endings. Uh, do do they do we use they in Italian or loro? There is some. Uh, no, thank you for the, the the question. There is some discussion about the loro, but uh, it's not used. Uh, um, it, it's not like in in real usage. It's it's not very common. So um, I I think we have just started uh, an avalanche here in Italy uh, in, in, the, in the last maybe six months. So I have no idea where, when, where we, we, we end up uh, with, with all these um, discussions about uh, uh, non-binary people. Because, uh, well, I, I would like to, to remind everybody that uh, uh, we in Italy are very conservative. Uh, also as a society. So both as, uh, I speak both as a feminist and both uh, with an interest with the LGBTQA plus issues. And um, for example, when I, when I write on Facebook, uh, which is, I have an open profile. So if somebody uh, speaks Italian or can understand Italian, they can go and check my, my profile. And I write a lot about these issues. And almost every time I write about this issue, some uh, very um, usually um, um, how do you say far far Catho very Catholic groups come in and tell me that this is all against nature. So even speaking about uh, non-binary people is against nature, and uh, this makes everything much more difficult because it's not obviously only a language issue or a, a self-representation or a self-expression issue, but it's a, it's a cultural issue. And even very forward people, very open-minded people at this point just stop. And the common reaction is non-binary people are, su are, su are such a small number that it's not interesting to pursue their interests, which is something I find again, very shocking. So. <laughs> Thank you for the question, Angela. Um, my colleague, Jennifer Meyer, has a question. Jennifer? Oh, hi. Um, I was, I, as I wrote in the chat, I think for me, it's, it's, I, it's really interesting to hear from you how to, especially I think this is something Kiki works on, how to introduce these, these choices at the early stages. Um, this has come up for me. I've been teaching French for a while, and it's come up for me several times. Um, and I sometimes find it a bit awkward because the student is just beginning to navigate this territory in their uh, native language. And then I'm introducing another language where we have less facility for sort of talking openly with each other. And we know each other less well. And I never want to out someone in front of their peers by accident. I mean, it, it, it does seem to me uh, a bit of a, um, I, 
again, it's hard, it's hard to um, approach it or not hard to approach it with sensitivity, but it's hard to have the strategies in place if it's not something you've kind of already thought of all the eventualities for. And I'm wondering if you have any basic strategies, any of you who've worked on this, um, for teaching a language and introducing these, these topics early enough to let students begin to become comfortable with how they identify themselves with their peers and with me. I'd be happy to start. Um, thanks for that question. Um, because I'm non-binary, <laughs> there's a little bit more ease for me because I'm using those forms, but I'm always pointing to the fact that it's messy. Oops, here's me trying to say a thing again that is going to be complicated in French and I need to work on it, right? Um, but from the onset, I, I normalize the inclusion of non-binary options, but in a very measured way early on, like from day one, if they're going to be learning. Well, I start with I and you, but once we've integrated third person, I automatically give options, but I don't ask my students ever in class to speak about themselves in a gendered way until they want to. And so back to this piece about like not correcting gender when it's about them, at least right at first, I think, is really, really important. Um, so I use a lot of activities about other people, right? And so like if there are non-binary celebrities and stuff like that, I'll use those examples <laughs> kind of foregrounding. We're going to practice this form with this person but not for them, but I do ask them to write to me, right, on the first day and just kind of like fleshing some of that out. I feel that once there's a good and supportive vibe in the classroom, usually students are really okay with it. And that in fact, the target language classroom is a very special space because we're so used to mistakes. We're in there just in a host of errors and a mispronouning just becomes one more error. It's like not a big deal. It's like somehow not a big deal about oops, sorry, you know, it's just another thing that we're correcting. And so in my experience, um, that's worked really well. But I have a lot of strategies for how to teach the gendered forms that are traditional because most of all cultural materials they're gonna find are gonna show that, right? Like that's the problem. If they go do some extra activities online, they're never gonna get a right answer for the stuff I'm teaching them, but they need the stuff I'm teaching them or they can't express themselves. So they have to kind of negotiate those two things. And I do have a chapter coming out soon that deals with kind of the applied aspect of very much that. And it'll also be a part of the um, decolonization diversity in the French curriculum conference next week that's free. So I can send the link if people are interested, just kind of like what works. Cause they have to learn adjective agreements but they can learn it about objects. They don't have to learn it about people all the time cause it's really complicated, you know and then keep building their skills. Thank you. I just, I love that permission to not correct gender right away. I feel like that's kind of just a, like, just don't correct it when they talk about themselves right away is just a, is a great place mm -hmm. to start. So thank you. Thank you for that. And, and yeah. another speaker mentioned that. It was kind of like, oh yeah, great. My favorite is to talk about restaurants and types of cuisine in French, because it's the masculine and the feminine, you know, and like, to, we really are going to practice them, but we're not going to emphasize it with, you know, individual. Uh, Professor Leiden, I believe, has something to say. Yeah, I just wanted to, I don't have language uh, teaching experience, so this is not directly relevant in, in that sense, but um, I just wanted to build on some of the distinctions that have been made. First of all, the idea of a grammatical gender, which is to say a purely um, formal convention that has no actual real world significance you know, cups are not male or female. That's kind of a meaningless idea. In theology, you get this issue with when it comes to God or divinity, right? But I think we can agree that cups, bridges, roads, they, you know, this is an arbitrary sign versus social gender. And one of the places, the flashpoints there is a couple of people have, uh, I think it was Vera who was referring to um, getting hate comments from conservative people because the signifier, the way in a strong version of the gender binary, you don't make distinctions between signifier and reality. You don't make a distinction between the sex of a body and the identity of the person who occupies the body. All of these things are bundled together. And mm -hmm. for people who are living in a world where in the strong form of a binary world, um, or who are anxious about losing it because binary thinking is a response to anxiety. It's a way of simplifying uh, 
reality that feels overwhelmingly complex. So you get both people who have grown up in a world where there's nothing but the strong binary and they're just not able to pull these things apart. So you, you say, we're gonna change a signifier and they react as though you have uh, pulled the center out of their universe. You've changed reality by changing the signifiers. But you also have people who are living with the difficulties of modernity and their anxiety makes them wanna defend those arbitrary signifiers because that represents the bulwark against the terrifying complexity of reality. We change the signifiers, then we have to acknowledge, right? We have to acknowledge the existence of ways of being human that we don't know what to do with and we don't want to know what to do with them. So there's a huge, uh, uh, there's a lot of work often to do in, in just negotiating the relation between grammatical gender and social gender. And as people have mentioned, social gender is also where we deal with the political issues of who gets recognized, what forms of humanness get recognized. Obviously, if it's controversial to uh, recognize the humanity of women, we're a long way from recognizing other <laughs> kinds of humanity that are, you know, are not uh, readily fitting even within the gender binary. But in a way, it's the same kind of issue, you know when um, the signifiers are seen as uh, representing social and political orders, changing the signifiers raises questions of uh, power. When you move over to the question of the way students use gender in classes, um, that's where you get the self-identification meeting the social gender. So one thing that I just wanted to highlight there is as you see in the term non-binary, non-binary is not a descriptor at all. It doesn't say anything about how the person who identifies as non-binary actually sees themselves. It just says, don't confuse me with anything that you think of as male or female. So that represents actually a failure of language. It's a triumph to even get to have people recognize that there are non-binary people. But that's just saying, you know, this is the end of the linguistic map. We have not filled in those blanks, but those blanks exist for everybody. So one thing that you can do, and particularly perhaps language learners is an opportunity to do this, is point out that even in people's own native languages, we always are struggling to make, um, you know, commonly used signifiers and conventions that are not designed to represent our individuality, to use those to reveal or conceal what we want others to see about ourselves. And it's always an imperfect process. Mm -hmm. We aren't gonna create a language that has a different pronoun system for every flavor of individual gender. So teaching students to recognize the choices, the compromises, give them tools for that um, and recognize that that's a common struggle. It's not just a minoritarian struggle. Certain kinds of people will have this as an issue, but most people don't have to worry about it that would be what I would recommend as a, as a trans person. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I add something? Because this, what, what Joy said is, is very, very interesting and, and um, touches me very deeply. Um, I think one approach that can be um, suggested to everybody who is here, who everybody speak more than one language, I guess, uh, is to note that these issues are uh, cross-linguistic issues, which means that is not something that is going on in your backyard, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's basically everywhere in the world where I would say the attention of the society is enough um, to, to include th this kind of um, new self-representations, I would say. Of course, um, I am half Hungarian. Uh, and going back to the question of how do non-gendered languages uh, behave, we don't have at all genders. Even the pronouns have no genders. So we have only one pronoun for everybody. Uh, and uh, that seems very uh, inclusive in a way. 
But uh, as you might know, right now, the, um, the Orban uh, administration is far from being inclusive in any way. There are uh, even um, witch hunts against uh, gay people. So it's not enough to, um, to have a non-gendered language to solve the, the gender issues. Uh, that's because language and, and the society and culture are so deeply entangled that uh, uh, words are never just words. Now, the, 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 I, I see that there is some kind of race towards having their own tag. Everybody wants, you know, in a way, their own tag. And uh, well, that go, goes back to, in, in a way, to the, um, to the Sapir War theory. Uh, which of course has been, um, I say, um, we have been over that for, for quite some years. But uh, one thing that the Sapir World theory says is that what you name can be seen better. So maybe right now in this moment, the need to have a name, to be taxonomized, some, to have a taxonomy be, stems from this, from the necessity to be seen. On the on the stage, I would say, you know, of of, uh, of society, and uh, but as as Joy said, um, I think this is a phase of over taxonomization, and maybe finding new categories, uh, also new pronouns and everything. I feel that this might be a phase, but not the conclusion of the linguistic journey. But I, I have no answers. This is just uh, something I, I put on the table to discuss about. Can I? So, yeah. Please, yeah, go ahead. Uh, no, uh, I was just thinking, and uh, and I think as as instructors, teachers, uh, when we think of a language inclusion, we, we have to consider that we are communicating through language in, in our classes. And for a lot of us, we are uh, uh, struggling in between languages and, and cultures. And I say for myself, like at this teaching Portuguese at a Spanish department at an American institution. So this, it goes in many ways. And I think we're trying to find ways that it's, I think inclu inclusive language is also about what we do in class and how we occupy the space. So how do, uh, my position as a cis man in my class uh, is is a way of uh, oppression or for others. How do I how do my students occupy the class? How do how do how do we sit in class? How do we uh, occupy the space around us? Who's using more space than others? How are we checking? And and the questions I think it's to me it's important because when we talk about inclusive inclusive language and, and representation, we we always talk about uh, misogyny. So how do our students communicate in class? So speaking more? And because there's, and I think like, like thinking of a neutral, neutrality, even in languages that there's no gender marked, genders are, languages are gendered. Like you think of English, and I think always the example of a words like nurse, the association of women, or when you watch television and you see like the police shows, they talk about an unsa, which is a word that I learned in English in the US, that it's they always they always use he when they talk about the criminal. So gender or masculinity is gonna find its way to invade our our daily our daily practices. So it's it's about how we use language, how we present language, and how we let the space that we occupy in the classroom uh, take over. And if we if we're not careful, I think we are going to exclude in the classroom because, and, and, and foreign language teaching is, is a form of exclusion because it, it is already a way that we put students in a classroom that are going to be separated from the others and create a community that it's a, a community that we only communicate. And there's a sense of like, when you speak a foreign language, it's a community, but it's not necessarily, it, it, it's a new language. And you think of a uh, Spanglish or Portuguese speakers in, in New York, there's, it's different from a Portuguese back home. So th there's so many levels that we have to find ways in our, in our daily practices to make sure that la inclusive language is not only what we speak, but as, as you guys are saying, like Vero was talking about the social aspects of it. It's like how we live our daily lives outside the classroom too. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Professor Neto. Um, and I think that that brings back a lot of what Joy uh, was saying with respect to gender as a highly localized, the highly localized systems of gender and the ways in which that needs to be negotiated. Um, my colleague uh, Arnaldo uh, Cruz Malavi has a has a question. Arnaldo. Sorry. Um, yeah, thank you so much for um, you know, your comments. Um, I, I, you know, I was wondering if, um, if, if in introducing these kinds of um, um, uh, alternative gender options, um, you had tried to refer to specific um, uh, communities that are innovating you know, in um, in using these practices because, or, or innovating new practices, no actual practices, because I know all over Latin America, um, the youth of a, people of a certain age kind of master uh, the use of this third uh, option, which which is the, the E, right? Uh, instead of saying todos or todas, you say todes. And um, I, I can possibly do it if I think about it a lot, but it doesn't come naturally to me. But it's it's actually in certain communities, it almost it has become natural um, because they have innovated and they have. So I'm just wondering if, in addition to you know, if one way to, of introducing this would be to actually to introduce actual practices, actual communities who practice, who innovate uh, these practices. I'd like to um, build on what Vera was saying about taxonomies, right? So communities that have different, more gender words, for example, or, or, or broader gender category terms. That's important, but you can never have enough where you end up with the Tower of Babel situation right. for gender. Yeah. Exactly. But in trans setting, there's another way of communicating that doesn't have uh, very much to do with taxonomies. It's that you turn gender into a story. And that's something that I think can be done in language classes. You ask, you uh, open up a space where people get to tell the story about their own relations to maleness, femaleness, other kinds of gendered experiences. Those stories use narrative conventions that we're very familiar with. We all have you know, so you have people who don't identify as trans at all. And they say, when I was growing up, I wanted to be just like my mother and she was like this and that, but then I became a tomboy. And then, you know, for everybody, we go through many, many different relations to gender and it turned and to describe those different moments in our lives and those different kinds of relations. We draw on the signifiers we have, but we, through the magic of narrative conventions and syntax, we're able to multiply the significances of them. And everybody has these kinds of gender stories and you don't always need very complicated commands of language in order to tell them. I don't know if that's... Yeah, that's good. Um, Alessia, you have a question here. Yep. So uh, by hearing what our colleagues said, I, I have this sense that really the change of uh, linguistic norms happens bottom up more than top down, meaning that institutions tend to be very um, conservative and defending some sort of ideal, you know, correct language. But then lead communities push for change, right? So in, in, in first of all, is this correct? And secondly, um, what is a good way for, or um, a smart way for, everybody to be advocate of um, inclusive language if that's the way it happens. Can I answer first? Do you mind? Uh, okay. <laughs> um, I would say that uh, in Italy, um, um, top-down uh, approach does not work. Uh, it has not worked uh, ever as um, the role, exactly the role of the Academia della Crusca is not the same as the French uh, uh, Academy or the Spanish one. So if the Academia della Crusca says something and says, you have to say this way, uh, Italian people just uh, send them, <laughs> react very badly, I would say so. So 
what I am practicing and what many other um, field researchers are practicing in Italy right now is exactly to give visibility to the use, uh, the, the, the um, how do you say, instinctive uses, usages of language that are going on in specific groups. So what is happening right now for me is the overpouring of these um, gender questions and issues from specific groups, which were feminist groups and LGBTQA plus groups to the general public. And uh, especially now the reaction is very bad, but I think this is a start. So people in Italy are starting to acknowledge the existence of, uh, of people that are not the ones that you are used to. And that's, that's, well, that's great for me. And what um, Joy said, uh, uh, to what Joy said, I would add, it's very important when you meet people that are directly I wouldn't say affected because it's not a you know it's it's not an illness, but are affected as people from the the the, the boundaries of languages, right? So or, or they don't feel like they can express themselves uh, throughoutly. And when you meet people and you speak with these people, everything becomes much more natural and clearer. There's nothing strange in this process going on. This is just uh, persons like me and you trying to find also their linguistic identity. So my good colleague Federico Faloppa, who studies hate speech and, and such, he says one of the important aspects of uh, when you work with inclusivity or diversity issues is to listen, is to listen to those who are directly in the process. And uh, this is not something our society used to, is used to, to listen others, right? You don't have to be a linguist to, to understand this issue because you might be experiencing it on your own skin. And for me, it's important to speak with people who experience these issues on their own skin. In a, can I? Yeah, uh, yes, I think yeah. a lot of question because when we think of a, especially romance languages, they are colonial languages, right? They're languages that conquered other so my speaking Portuguese or any Hispanic uh, Latin America or uh, French and Dutch in all uh, the Americas, they're colonial languages, right? And they were forced upon uh, new populations. And in the case of Portuguese and Brazil, like Brazil, Portuguese was uh, only uh, officialized in the 18th century. So we had a different language for a type of Creole until uh, 1750s and then it was forbidden. So there's a clear uh, political agenda and the changes in language, they actually come from uh, uh, like answering what you say from the bottom. It's like it's a population we're making the changes, but then it's, it's from the top, we're gonna make the decisions what's gonna be a rule or not. So in, in our case in Brazil, the first Brazilian grammar is from the 20th century. So until uh, late 19th century, we were making mistakes because we're not following the Portuguese uh, rule. We could also, find many examples in French Canadian, things that are not according to uh, the, uh, what, the way they speak in French now that in any Hispanic country in Latin America. So, but who's making the decisions to make it a rule? It's, it's a top decision. It's those who wrote grammars. And in the case of uh, uh, Latin America, the first grammars uh, that, are, that we use, they were made by men men and professors who decided what became a rule in the case of Brazil that were not Portuguese. And then we go to Portugal nowadays, Portuguese people are gonna say that we don't speak Portuguese, we speak Brazilian, which is a very political uh, thing to say. And I, I think it's a, an hour discussion, we don't, we're not getting that. But the fact that they say that we don't speak Portuguese anymore, it is a way of saying, you are destroying our language. Which I think it's, yes, yes, thank you. We're welcome, we are gonna do it. And gender is the same thing. We're exp we're trying because we're we're having this conversation right now about gender. Who's going to make the decision? Then it, it's up to us to make sure that we make that decision and we accept inclusive language. And because if not, the French Academy or the Italian or the Portuguese any academy is going to say no. That is not right because. It is a form of control, right? When you say that something's not right in grammar, as I said before, the use of subjunctive, that we don't do it anymore in, in, in Brazil, it is a, a mistake, but it's a form of control to say your Portuguese is not good enough. So 
but we have to be aware of the, the changes. Thank you, Joan. Um, are there any, is there, we're kind of over right now in terms of our time. I'm just wondering if there are any final questions from a student? Um, if not, maybe we'll give the last word to the panelists and then we will finish up. Any, any questions from any of the students who have come today? Um, all right. Uh, there are a couple, there's one yeah, in the team. Uh, Jack Nassar says, if many languages have a standard form used by new casters and educated people, um, wouldn't it make sense to try to change the standards there? Yes, <laughs> I can say um, this is this perhaps connects the last two questions as well. And part of what I was thinking and, and hearing the rest of you talk, this is where the overlay between the work that is being done largely in feminist circles and, you know, allies of feminist issues, whether they identify as feminist or not, right, with the queer piece. Um, there are many organizations now in the, in the Francophone context that are using inclusive writing and that are speaking in more inclusive ways. Of course, there are issues, but there's a whole list through um, the Mo Clay group that publishes the manual. And that is starting to, you know, that's starting to take shape, right? So like, how do we coalition build around that? I wanted to say, yes, this is grassroots work, especially in the classroom context, right? Like we are in charge of the way language gets used in our classroom, but also, in a responsible way so that our students are prepared to go out into the world and into other kinds of contexts. So for me, you know, I absolutely look to non-binary Francophone communities, right? And I'm like peripherally tagged in, but I live in the Midwest right now, right? And mostly speak French with my students, right? <laughs> so what do we do in our classroom to build proficiency, build their agency? But then I have, you know, young French teachers who now they're teaching their student teachers when they're on their internships how to use some of these forms and support their students in that way. And you do start to grow a movement. But I also think that another piece of this, if you look at the more top-down part, is to use the academy's language against itself, right? Like I like to use <laughs> traditional academic French <laughs> for my own purposes. Um, if you are able to link to my article, there's a novel by um, Angareta, who's now in the Ulipo, right? But it's a, it's a genderness, a genderless love story that could also be read as a non-binary love story. It's written in academic French. I think like appropriating those pieces of it that work, but leveraging them for our own purposes is really very powerful. And that um, eventually those systems in power have to recognize if they want their language to proliferate and survive, you know, young people, people of all generations who are identifying in these ways need to be able to talk about themselves. So it's a both and kind of strategy there. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you, Kiki. I think we need to end it. Unfortunately, it's uh, 3.39, but um, thank you so much to our panelists today. Um, we are going on December 2nd, we have a panel, uh, do you have an accent? And I think many of the things that you have begun to uh, brought up right now are going to uh, be pivotal to some of those conversations uh, in December. Um, our next uh, roundtable is on November 18th. Um, it's on food and colonial legacies. So um, hopefully you will be able to join us uh, for that. Thank you all for coming today. And thanks again to our fantastic speakers for giving their time and um, sharing so much with us. Thank you very much. Thank you.